All right, so the third FRQ question you run into on the AP Physics C exam is the experimental lab. And this is um, was common on AP Physics 1, AP Physics 2, but not directly done in AP Physics C. So this will be one of the newer FRQ styles for AP Physics C students. Um, a lot of the past exam questions will have elements of parts of the analysis, but not really the experimental design. So um, basically it's divided into two sections. You're gonna have two parts and they're pretty separate parts. They're connected only in by the topic, but they're really, there's a design and an analysis step. The analysis step is actually done in past FRQs for AP Physics C or parts of it. So that one's gonna be pretty normal, but the design is gonna be new like for Physics C specifically. What you're gonna do is you're gonna do an experiment design. They're going to give you a scenario. They're actually going to give you a lot of the equipment you're allowed to use. And so you have to understand that you will want to vary a single parameter. You want to measure that, how that change affects it. And uh, they're pretty standard things that you would find in a high school laboratory. It's not super complicated, but it is something that you're going to have to get used to. Um, you're expected to describe a method to collect data that could be analyzed. Now, very commonly, that's by using a line of best fit, but that's not exclusively. There could be other ways that you might do this. It could be graphical or some kind of comparison or calculation in the analysis, but very common to use a line of best fit. So let's look at, um, so that's the experimental design. The analysis is generally speaking, you are going to be, they're gonna give you an experimental setup already. So it's gonna be a different experimental setup than what you do in the design portion. And then you are going to then, um, plot some kind of graph or data, usually looking at linearizing it so you can either get the slope or the y-intercept to extract some information in there. So linearization is going to be a big part of that. And um, you will use that calculation of that slope to uh, answer the question. So let's take a look at the example of an experimental lab. So a group of students have two carts, cart one, cart two, each of known mass M1 and M2 respectively. The carts are pla uh, placed on a straight horizontal track. Cart one is given an initial speed V0 toward the right. Cart two is initially at rest and has a spring attached to it as shown in figure one. Cart one collides with cart two. The group of students want to determine the relationship between V0 and the fraction of kinetic energy remaining after the collision, which is described by the ratio K total F over K total I, total kinetic energy. Describe an experimental procedure to collect data that would allow the students to determine the initial speed of cart one uh, if the initial speed of cart one changes the ratio of the kinetic energy final to initial. Provide enough detail so that the experiment could be replicated, including any steps to reduce experimental uncertainty. So you always need to vary some kind of quantity on what we can measure. Now, what kind of equipment are they giving us? I guess they're not telling us, so we get to use um, the equipment. Um, a lot of times in some of them, at least in AP Physics 1, they've been listing out the equipment, so that might happen sometimes where you're specifically given the equipment. This one example, they didn't, but it's very common too. So in this case, since we get to choose, what are the things that we're going to vary and what are the responses? Well, we got to vary. We want a relationship to be V0, so we do need to vary this. Okay, so we need to measure that somehow, and the easiest way is to do a motion sensor. So we're going to use a place a motion sensor, motion sensor um, on the left side. Let's see, then we're going to launch the cart one towards the right. Um, we want to we actually want to put left side and place one motion sensor on the right side and one on the right side because we need to measure oops one on the right side as well we need to measure the speed of both objects so we're going to need a motion sensor over here and we're going to need a motion sensor over here it's probably the most direct way to calculate the speed of anything okay towards the right um, we are going to record the initial velocity of cart one and then after the collision record the velocity of cart two of cart two cart one and cart two okay so that would be enough right that would explain everything we need to do there and uh oh yeah we, we need to oh, sorry we need to that that will that will be one trial we want to vary something so we're gonna we're gonna repeat the steps so we're gonna repeat 
two through four um, with different with five different initial velocities. Because we want to see how changing because changing that v zero is going to affect that total 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 thing there. Okay, um, describe how the collected data could be used to analyze to determine whether the value of changes. So you could plot it or something like that. You're going to compare, but we could plot. Um, let's see the k total f, which would equal one half m1 v1 f squared plus one half m2 v2 f squared. Um, oh, sorry, let's, let's plot this. And this would be one half m1 v0 squared. That's the initial kinetic energy. So we're going to, sorry, let me set the equal. We're going to plot that ratio versus the velocity, the v0. And if the line is horizontal, or the line of best fit is horizontal, then it implies that there's uh, no relationship. Okay, so that would be enough to sort of explain that portion there. Um, sometimes on the experimental design part, you may want to repeat each trial, repeat each velocity three more times. Usually this, this varying this will be enough to count as the reducing the experimental uncertainty. But if you want to re just reduce it even more, you can just repeat each velocity three more times or three times total. All right, cool. Now we go to the second part, which is sort of they're giving you an experimental setup. So it's unrelated, like a totally different scenario. It's only related in that it's probably related to kinetic energy, momentum, collisions, possibly. Who knows? But it's similar, but not like nothing really connected. So if even if you couldn't do the first part, the second part is going to be completely different. So later experiment, cart one is placed at the bottom of the ramp. So cart one is M1. An impulse device at the bottom of the ramp delivers an impulse to cart one that's directed up the ramp by quickly releasing a burst of high pressure air shown in figure two. The magnitude of the impulse delivered to the cart is the same in all trials. So we have the same impulse being delivered. So impulse being the integral of F dt or F delta t, but that's the amount there. Blocks of different nose masses can be attached to cart one. So we can attach different size masses. Students are asked to determine the value of the impulse determined to the block cart system by the impulse device. The students measure the combined mass of the cart and block. The impulse de delivers an impulse to the block and measures the maximum vertical height. So uh, we're gonna measure the maximum vertical height that we reach, and that's when the velocity is zero. Um, the experiments are repeated using different blocks of different masses. The students' measurements are shown below. Indicate two quantities when graph produces a straight line that can be used to determine the numerical value for the impulse delivered by the impulse device. You may use blank columns to fill in extra data and stuff like that. So you always want to derive a relationship. What is, this is the impulse. So the, this is the thing we want. This impulse is going to cause a change in momentum, right? So that's going to be MV final minus MV initial. Now it launches from rest. So that's going to be zero. So this is the thing we want. We need to know how fast he's moving. However, we are not recording how fast he's going. We are recording how high they're going. So we can use conservation of energy to go from there to there. Okay, to say like, oh, well, let's see, let's call this VF and we'll call this zero. So um, at the bottom, if our system is going to be the earth plus the block, because we're having a change in height, then the energy at the bottom is just gonna be the kinetic energy. And the energy at the top is just gonna be uh, MGH. And that's gonna be one half M1 VF squared is equal to that. Sorry, the M1's cancel. So VF is going to be square root of 2GH, which we then can calculate to here. So our impulse, integral F dt, is going to be M1 times square root of 2GH. And let's just call this, so I don't have to keep writing the M, but we'll just call this the impulse. We'll call that, uh, we'll call that Y. Y is equal to M1 square root of 2H, 2GH. Or we'll call that, uh, I don't know what letter to give it. Physics were already, all right, we'll just, we'll just leave it like that. I want to solve for this guy, ultimately. 
And so what's varying is M1 is varying and H is varying. So those need to be on separate sides. One's got to be horizontal, one's got to be vertical. So why don't we, just simplest thing, probably just divide the square root of 2GH over here on both sides. So we have M1 is equal to 1 over square root of 2GH times the impulse. So then we can plot this as our Y variable, plot this as our X variable, and those are varying, and then this is our slope or our being constant. Because remember, when we do linearization, right, the slope has to be the constant value, and then uh, we just want to make it look like y equals mx, right? And so we're going to plot m1 on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, 1 over the square root of 2gh. g, you can use 9.8 for that. So now we need to comp compute those values. And one of the things is like, on, because we are on Blue Book now, uh, for the, the testing, you will have access to Desmos. So I'll kind of give you an easy way to compute these values if you want. You can put in a table. And so we have M1 already. That's our Y axis. Our, but here, let's put in the numbers because we have to compute all the new values for the linearization. 0 0.07, 0 0.035, and then 0 0.015. However, I now want to plot, or I not plot, I want to... I want to compute 1 over the square root of 2 times 9.8 times, and we'll just call it x1. Oh, I, I guess you can't do that here. I forgot. You can't do it for y1. You have to do it here. So now this will give us our values, and this is just easier to read off uh, on here. So this is going to be 1 over square root of 2 gh, and you'll get to write it down on your piece of paper in front of you. But uh, this will be 0 0.36. This will be 0 0.56, 0 0.85, 1.2, and then 1.8, or 1.21 and 1.84. Okay, so that'll give us those values there. And then now we can plot that on the axes. Now, when you do the graphs, you do need to label the axes, including the units. So the y axis is going to be M1B, and you just put parentheses kilograms there. The x-axis is going to be 1 over a square root of 2gh. And the units of that is, this is meters per second squared times meters, meters. It's seconds per meter, I think, is going to be that value there. Okay, so you just have to compute that in. And you got that by 1 over a square root of 2 meters per second squared times meters. So this is 1 over the square root of meters squared per second squared, which is 1 over meters per second, which is second over meters. So that's kind of how I computed that part there. Now, I want to label some numbers, and we want to make sure we use up at least half the graph. We're going to go from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. So make the 0, make each of these like that. That's pretty easy. And then here, we're going from 0 0.36 to 1.84. So this needs to be probably about 1.0 and 2.0. So this is 0 0.5, and then this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So each of these is 0.1. So that'll be that'll be a nice uh, thing there. So then um, our x-axis is 0 0.36. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 6 is here, and we go up to 0.1. Then we're going to go 0 0.5. 0 0.56 is right about there, and we go up to 0 0.15. 1, 5 is halfway between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. Then 0 0.85 and 0 0.25. 0.9, 0 0.85, and then 0.25 is halfway. Okay, and then 1.21 and 0.35. 1.12 and then 0.35 is about there. And then 1.84, this is 1 1.5, 6, 7, 8. 1.84 and then 0.5. Right around there. Okay, so it looks pretty linear. So then we're going to draw our line of best fit. And that goes through it. That wasn't really good to start with, but. Uh, okay, well, it's probably a little steeper than that. So let me try again. When you have a ruler, it'll be a lot easier. Okay. And one more try. If you had a ruler, like I said, it'd be a lot easier to do this on the paper. You just line it up so that it becomes a straight line. But you'll have it on a piece of paper that you can do that. 
geez, why are you having, you know, let me just, they've changed the one note. So the line is, line tool is not that good anymore. Um, I'm going to move it a little bit. Okay, cool. That looks pretty good. So then when you want to calculate your slope, you're going to circle two points on here that are easy to read. So I'm going to pick that point there and then maybe this point here. So this point is 1.9 and this is 5, 1, 2, 3, comma 5.3, right? And then this point here is 0 0.5 and the y value is like 1.12, 0 0.1, actually, uh, each of these is one, two, three, four, five, uh, point, two, point four, point one four. Yeah, because each of these is point two. So then our slope is going to be five point three minus zero point one four divided by one point nine minus zero point five, and that's going to give us five point three minus point one four. Wait, do I did this? This is this is five point six then. Sorry, because each of these is point two. So it'd be 5.56, I don't know, say 5.6, 0 0.56. 0 0.56 minus 0.14. And then divided by 1.9 minus 0.5, I get 0 0.3, and that is Newton meters, right? Newton meters, yeah, that's it, units of impulse there. So that would give me that value there. And that's the whole thing. That's all the parts. I kind of do all the parts kind of bleed together. You label the axis, you calculate the data, you plot it, uh, you draw a line to best fit, you calculate the slope. Or if it's not slope, it could be y-intercept. But you're linearizing it. In this case, it is the slope that gives us the impulse.